beautiful centre target. Hit. Top right corner. Hit. Middle centre plate. Oh, awesome. Uh, there we go. <laughs> Left, right on edge of target, hit. Good shot, mate. Today I'm going to reload a video which was some of my reloading practices. Two and a half, three years ago, some things have changed, some things have stayed the same. Um, but I wanted to reload, there was some controversy, there were some people, things that people didn't understand in what I did in the video um, and disagreed with what I did in the video. Um, and as I said then, and you'll see again shortly, um, it's not something I think I'm 100% at or that I do, I suppose what I'd say is I do very much different to what a lot of the world do, but it works for me. I'll go back through the video and I'm going to interject in, in places to try and explain a little bit more some of those more um, hard to understand pieces of the video. Anyway, here we go. I'll start the video and you'll see me again in a little minute. I've been asked to do some reloading videos um, and to show um, just what it is I get up to in the way of reloading my ammo. Um, I've been a little hesitant to do it simply because it's not something that I um, feel I'm an expert in, um, but it works okay for us what, what we do. So anyway, I'll start with some, um, I, I also, I suppose one of the things I start with with doing my ammo is I try and keep it very consistent and I'll tend to try and do 50 in a row type thing so I don't want to do too much but I don't want to do too, too little, I want it nice and consistent and also don't have interruptions, so I want to be looking at the thing the whole time I'm a, I'm a tradesman in the rest of my life um, and I've got habits that I work with and so I will for this, for the purposes of this video just be doing three um, they're not going to go into my normal cycle but they'll still go through all the processes of what I do so anyway, what I do, and I'll start with essentially the normal thing. These are these are fired rounds. These are my three three at the um, I would normally go through. I, I get all the rounds out. I sit them out on the bench. Um, I do a basic visual, visual inspection, make sure they're all fine. Um, they obviously all fired fine. I'll do a normal check over of my primers, how everything was firing, firing, what sort of pressures I'm running, making sure everything stayed as consistent as it was. And obviously, I'll also have a record of what the shots did. Um, once, if they're basically fine, there's no dirt and garbage on them, then that's the. I don't go and tumble them or clean them at any at this stage. I really only one might run my brass for a set amount of time. So, in the likes of the three three retour, really around the five to six firings is as much as they get, and then they go into storage to be re annealed or worked with later on. But essentially, at this stage, I just um, I put them in a bin and store them, and I break out another new set. Um, once I've done that inspection where I've got them all clean like that, then I actually use something probably different to anybody else. I use Blister, which I use for most of my gun. Okay, well at that point in the video, um, I was talking about using Blister, which I still use in the way of cleaning guns. I no longer use at all. I found it was um, not as easy to use as using simple old CRC in actual spraying on the brass. And I should explain a little bit there. <coughs> when I'm doing just uh, these are my 308 um, and I'm just going to go through there essentially I do full size these but they don't need much in the way of full sizing they're just really running more of an excise and when I actually do that with the um, with any of the brass that is just an excise or a very light sizing I am still using the likes of the CRC just a, just a spray on lubricant any spray on lubricant would do the job I make sure that I'm running um, I want a nice a very fine mist so I'm spraying a very fine mist to try and get the whole outside of the case covered. Um, I will in a lot of cases when I'm doing full sizing in the bigger brass especially but any stuff that needs more work then I'm running a proper case loop. So I'm running one of the foam pads, I'll run the likes of the RCBS case loop, I put it on here, rub it all in and then I'll actually run the roll the case around it. I'll grab a case, don't need two of these, but I'll roll a case around in it um, so it's actually being rolled around and I'll actually also make sure that I'm getting some on the inside of the neck. Go through and do it. That is where I'm using the proper case lube when I want to do a proper heavy um, resize is what I'm actually doing there. Simply through the fact of the likes of any of the spray on lubricants I've used um, 
especially in the in this sort of stuff that's not really designed for it, um, is not giving me a smooth enough action and you can start to find your brass jamming in your actual sizing dies. Uh, but for, as said, um, in the case of like these 308s and um, the other ones that I just do a neck size on in particular, the spray and lube does a good job. It, do, it lets it lube the neck by spraying lightly from one side to the other side you get a tiny bit on the inside of the neck as well um, and what it's actually causing is where you actually run through your neck sizer it cleans off the little bit of carbon on the outside which you can rub off afterwards um, while you're also um, sizing things and it lets you clean things down so yes I do use it probably not recommended by most people works works nicely for what I do um, and as I'd say and qualify through the whole video is this is what works for me not what I'm suggesting other people do but this is what I do and people want to see that um, let's carry on watch the rest of the video cleaning and I put a little tiny spray over both sides so I want very little of the of the blister of the, the lube on there I'm using as a case lube I don't want much um, if you put too much on you can end up where you get crush points and things around the top of your, um, just below the neck of the case. But I just put a little bit on and then I tend to go across and wipe it all over on each as I actually load them into. And this is where I wipe my bench. This is when they'll first get to go into the tray ready for loading. So I've got it all around any of the excess carton and things that have been taken off. But that's the process I'll do there. The next process is to take the primers out. Now in the video where I said that I um, push the primers out, I'm actually doing my sizing of course. It's the first place I'm doing the sizing um, and it is the, the, the main place I do the sizing. Um, a few people commented that when I run the, through the sizer at the end of it and I've already done the trimming, I've done it the wrong way around. They're dead right. You um, shouldn't be trimming it and then doing your sizing. The way I'm doing it is different than that. I'll explain again when I get to that part in the video, but what I'm actually doing is doing the sizing. Whether it's the full sizing or just neck sizing, whatever it is, the sizing is happening um, at the front edge. Uh, it's the first thing I'm really doing. I'm popping the primer out, but I didn't say that I'm also doing the sizing at that stage. So this comes out now, then I do all the other bits and pieces which will carry on in the video. Uh, and then I run it back through just a neck sizer, or I'll explain more about the different choices I've got then. But yes, you should definitely be doing your sizing, full length, neck sizing, whatever it is, before you do your trimming. Anyway, we'll see you again in a minute. Try and make sure when I spray that lube on, that I get a little bit into the neck of it as well, just enough to help with lubing. Um, at this stage, I'll tend to go across um, with a rag or with my fingers and just take off any. Uh, yes, I, as I explained, I largely clean the brass down. Um, if you can see there, this is what the brass looks like when it has been simply um, hit with a CRC, run through the sizer, and then. With that CRC lubing and, and softening the carbon, simply wiped, and what the brass looks like now. And that's what I'm going to get. Now I'm ready to do my trimming and deburring and clean the primer pocket. But that's the process of a very simple side of loading I'm doing at this stage. The, the extra carbon that's stuck to that has been pushed off by the system. Um, and also then go through and run um, back through and clean my my uh, when I actually go back through and make sure there's no build up inside here but it's an important part of um, uh, essentially where I can see things and inspect things properly um, that's basically at that point we start doing our checks over with things now I use the my Lehman trimmer which um, in the long term I'll probably have one for every set of round but I essentially use a case that is that is essentially sized to exactly the size I want things to be I go through and set it up in this, adjust everything to suit this case which stays with my trimming set and then I'll run all of the cases through that 
just to make sure they are all completely consistent. I'm not expecting to see much more than exactly what you probably can see there. It is just skimmed over the edge, really not taking off any quantity. Um, but I get to see, I get to see how much my brass is growing or what's actually happening with it. just just touch so that's exactly what I expect to see out of a out of a game of cases um, beyond that point I will I should say also I will actually put them through the, the trim on a brand new case in the early days I didn't and with something like this these are Lapeur cases um, so and in the normal cases and in the Seiko cases I find <laughs> that um, it's all the same they're, they're they don't need a lot done to it. I just tend to find a little bit of, um, I suppose, a little bit of force of habit, but really trying to keep things consistent and trying to keep my MOA right down. Um, the, um, or my group sizes right down. The next process is the simple cleaning. Now, I used to use um, all hand tools. Um, it's only over the last year or so that I've, I've got myself one of these RCBS um, trim units, or case, sorry, the case prep unit. But um, uh, which makes it a little bit faster is the only thing. Uh, what I do use, I do use one of these tools, which is essentially a, um, a nice, it's for the VDL bullets. It actually takes your inside of your case to a very nice angle, only a very light amount of um, machining or, or, or just take that edge off. What I found with that, it really does help and make the cases, so make, make the bullets load easier. They go in very smooth. That's a very important part of this process is making sure that that is all very very consistent. Your, your case tension um, or your, your bullet to case tension is one of the very very important parts of getting the smallest group you can. So essentially I'll go through with that. Um, I'll turn this machine on. I then I'll go through and okay oh, I missed a step. I better do that. Um, that's what happens when you're talking. Uh, what I normally would do once I've actually gone through and trimmed um, is go through and just run this through the firing hole. So it's what I actually do is it's really a new brass thing. I go through and I actually mount this. You're going to fire in a drill. I set it all up and I actually have this little set up to the right place to where I'm actually drilling. Um, and I'll properly use a piece of brass. I'll grab a piece of brass. It's just a, an old piece of brass, 44 grains, so let me just put that in here. And I'll actually, to start off with, I'll go through and um, do this. I'll actually put it in here, make sure I'm centered, I actually should center this down so it's just touching on the neck here. But what I'm actually doing is I'll run it through there. And this is an old piece of brass. I don't know if this actually happened, this piece of brass. No, it didn't. See, I've actually taken out some material, which is what I do. I really do that once on new brass before I actually do it. This is probably five years old, this piece of brass sitting in a dead brass pile over here. But that's what I'm actually doing, and I'm using a cordless drill to go through and do that. Now, it might be not the appropriate way to do it. I'm sure there's some expert that will tell you that I'm doing it wrong. It's what I do, and I'm making sure that I've got a uniform little chamfer on the inside of the brass just out of the firing hole so anyway that's what it is it's a it's a firing hole unifier um, and I'm putting that little chamfer and it also takes out any little um, dags or anything in the actual hole where it's being pressed through inside the brass let's carry on the firing hole unifier, unifier um, and I do that on brand new brass in particular taking out any bits of, of um, where irregularity in the hole down there but I run it through all them Simple as that. Then we go through here, and I'll go through and do this process. Clean out our primer pocket. Um, I do have a unifier on here as well. Um, and in the first running, I will tend to use that. I don't know how super important it is. It's more um, irregular brass, but it's something I still do um, at one stage in the in the brass's life, at least. Just a little deeper on the outside. Up through here. Nice and clean and done. Okay, 
that's that process. At this stage, I will tend to go through and um, do the light lube again. Um, and then this is just a worn out piece of Scotch Brite, um, which has got a reasonable amount of lube and, and carbon and stuff in it. But I tend to just wipe over the, the bullet case, sorry, the, the neck, um, and just going into the shoulder, um, where I'll go through and get that nice and clean at that stage. So that's essentially getting any extra carbon off. I don't tumble them um, through the life. I'm not using old damaged brass, so I, I basically leave them to this level of clean. But as you can see at this point, let's go in there and get any excess carbon off. At this time, depending on the brass and how smooth it goes through, but I'll tend to give it a tiny touch with some more lube. And then go through the final size of what I'm actually doing with things. Chamfered with the VLD chamfer on the inside. I've chamfered on the outside, or deburred on the outside, and I've cleaned the primer pocket. I don't know if you can see in there, but clean primer pocket, and the, the brass looks like this. It's all finished. Um, this is as clean as I take the brass in this situation. Um, and what I've found there, um, I do um, stainless steel media tumble the brass and get it super clean sometimes. Um, I did a lot of that um, a season and a half ago, a season ago I was doing a lot of that and, and getting to the point where it's really nice to have lovely clean brass. I didn't find any benefits in the shooting side of things and some slight detractions. I found some less consistency when I was polishing too much. So what I've found and my conclusion is um, both the, the inside of the action and the brass that is um, in, from what I've found, a little better to be have a slight traction to it. It helps the actual action work, so it helps the actual how a gun works. Um, as people might realise, the bolt and the action is only part of the strength of, of retaining against the brass expansion and brass movement. Another part of that process is the grip between the brass and the actual chamber itself. So super polished brass. Um, yeah, listen, it may not be doing anything. To me, I felt I was starting to get some slight inconsistencies there. So as long as it's clean and serviceable, I'm quite happy using it like this. As you see, it's all cleaned. I'll probably do three firings like this, and then it'll go in the tumbler to bring it back to shiny looking again. But shiny looking isn't the important thing to me. How it actually operates is important to me. Now the other bit of this is that even though I've got this place where most people would leave it, whether they've tumbled it or ultrasonic cleaned it or polished it in any form but get to where it's all finished like this is where it's done. A bit that people don't understand and what I'm doing is I run it back through the sizer again. So I'll do that to uh, all of the brass so it's all in that consistent place. Now what I'm doing and I should explain here this takes it to where you got a very similar look, it's actually a tiny bit smoother up the top here and what I'm really doing is getting it smoother on the inside here. When I, when you shamp, dish or deburr, chamfer, whatever you actually want to call it, when you do all your finishing, you still have a metal cut finish. What I want is the bullet to go in there when it's loaded to be as smooth as possible. So by running something through, in this case I'm just running it back over, this is actually a full length die. This is the only one I do that on, or actually my 243 I do it on as well. Uh, but it's not, it's already been full size so it's not changing the length running it through there again. The only thing that's actually getting pushed around is the neck is getting pushed in a tiny bit and then pulled back out. The last thing that comes through it um, is the expandable. And that's what I do on this brass. On some other stuff, my 338, my um, 7 mil, I'm actually, I will, um, and it depends what I'm doing, it's different to all brasses, um, I'm, I'm doing 10 different calibers, um, at any stage I'm doing one of 10 different calibers or two or 10 different calendars, I'll tend to do two lots of loading at once. Um, and it's different for all of them and it changes as the season goes, as I'm going, I'm always adapting, I'm always adjusting to what my brass is telling me and what my loads are telling me. Um, 
In some cases, some of them, I'm running the last thing I run through it. I don't run any external sizing. I just run the expandable backward, backwards and forwards through it because um, I just simply want to get any burrs on the inside there to be um, dead smooth. And I've got an expandable that when I run it through back through again, actually takes it to where the bullet loads in at exactly the tension I want it to be. Um, in some of them, I've done a full size to start off with, and then this process is just done with the next size. Um, in other ones, I'm just neck sizing, that's all I'm doing, and they get the neck size again. But what I want to point out is I'm not changing the length of it. It's already had the work done to the brass. This is just running through over, in some cases, both of the neck, both outside and inside. In some cases, just the inside. And as said, that I found, I've worked out what works for that brass. I set up my um, loading stuff on the bench here, what I use. In the cupboard in behind the camera there is all the other stuff which gives me more choices and more flexibility when I want to go there but um, yeah I'll carry on and do this and I'll see you again in a minute maybe overworking it for the brass to um, a lot of people's thoughts um, to me I'm just making sure that any excess little pieces of the bag or any little bits and pieces of the cleaning process um, are all completely gone at this stage I'll also go through and wipe and do my final inspection um, I do find an occasion with older brass you might find that you created a split and stirred it up by rubbing it around uh, but um, as a rule this is just a, a final inspection get the grease and things off it make sure it's all really nice and you do really end up with a nice finish with smooth edges it really is a nice piece of brass to handle at that stage okay so now I've actually been through I've, I've sized I've done all the prep, I've done the trim, I've cleaned out the bottom, um, the, I've made sure that there's no stuff stuck in the firing hole. Um, I'll then go through at this stage and simply load the primers. Um, I use another RCBS piece. You'll notice also the, the press is the, uh, the rock crusher unit as well, uh, which I find works really nicely. So go through and load these. I use this hand tool. It gives me a nice feel to the unit so I can actually feel them going properly. And you want that to be nice and uniformed. Yep, okay. That's that process. Part of, of this, and normally I'm obviously doing 50 brass, but I'll go through and then check everyone. I want to make sure that's sitting nice and flat. You've got the feel of it going in, but um, one of the things that I find of loading brass is that they, um, the extra checking is, is part of the process. I want complete consistency, but I also don't want mistakes halfway through. Anyway, that's the process that ends up with my brass, prime brass, ready to go, ready to load. Um, I suppose the other details I'd go through, which I find, have found relevant. Um, essentially, in, in the theory of things, you can take any brass and take it to do that amount of work to it and maybe a little bit more and end up in the same place. I really found that not to be the case. I found essentially there are the obvious differences between cheap brass and or, or just reusing brass and getting quality brass in the fashion of the internal structure of the brass. Uh, the likes of this Lapeur brass has more room inside there, there's more capacity. Um, there's they do it's a very consistent brass to use so it's nice and neat we tend to find it's got better life and things in it um, but then it's in the finer details of how nice the the um, primer is retained what that what that pocket actually works like how nice the um, the essentially the the probably one of the most important details is the is the tension to the bullet um, and I found in better brass you simply have better results but um, yeah, not to say that you can't do it with just reloading the, the factory ammo and then go through and, and doing the work with the brass and get to a certain point. I've still found there tends to be a little subtle difference. Anyway, I'll now put this stuff away and we'll set it ready to um, do some putting powder and, and loads in. Okay, uh, well I'm now repositioned everything and set myself up for doing the, um, the actual loading of the bullet. Um, I use one of the Charge Master, another RCBS product. And I would say with that, I, I don't know if these are any better or any worse than, than the gang. Um, being over in Australia, where it's a, probably a little more challenged in, in getting some of the stuff. But um, we, um, I've done a little bit of research. I've, I've liked what I saw and this sort of stuff and, and, and what I could find um, and found it's worked really well. 
Uh, this unit I really like how it works. Um, I certainly have done the, the McDonald's straw mod and, the, and, and recalibrated the things a little bit to make it a little faster and a little more consistent. Um, and I found it works well. I would say, and part of what I do with loading, um, I, I tend to be weighing my brass um, and know that it's all roughly consistent. Another thing that you tend to find in quality brass is it starts off more consistent. Uh, but I really want to know where it is and if I do have heavy brass or light brass then it will tend to go um, out of that 50, it will, the group wants to be pretty even. Um, I obviously weigh my brass here. Um, um, I also uh, afterwards um, and with any questions through things, if I'm not sure I got distracted or anything like that, I'll go through and check halfway through my run even to make sure using another scale, using this other scale. But in the end of it, I'll go through and do a good check across things and make sure. And I really don't want to see a whole round, any, you know, a range of, of two grams across the whole lot is the absolute most I'd accept. And in most cases, when I'm really pushing the boundaries, I don't want to see more than one grain of difference between the complete rounds from start to finish. Anyway, I'll go through that process. Um, this has all been calibrated and checked and fired up. So we'll go through... Um, on one of our bigger rounds, uh, which is the 96 grains, um, and we're using their uh, 2225. Um, once again, there's probably a few less choices over here, um, and I haven't pushed the boundaries too much on trying all sorts of different powder. I powder, found a powder that worked well, um, and then I stick with that. Um, and, and then and in some other place, I'll go into some of my logic on how I um, go through and develop a round and develop a, a, um, a load. Um, which is once again quite different to what a lot of people are doing. But anyway, we'll go with this. This is 96 grains of the AR Triple T5, um, and we'll start to um, load them. And while that's happening, the, these are obviously the um, uh, well, the, obviously these are a 300 grain um, burger round. So in the in the OTM, so these are what we've done our our big stuff with, um, and uh, a um, uh, work very well. I find very consistent. I, I struggle to find a grain of difference in, in or even the 0.2 grains of difference across the across the loads when I check them. But um, they are um, working really well for us. Okay. Okay. While that's loading, we'll go through the process. I normally actually will let a, a run of five go and then go loading. I tend to get impatient waiting for the machine um, and uh, so essentially keep it all flying like that. Um, the piece I would suggest that uh, I want to point out, okay, so that's the first one. What I'm actually using in this is one of the Foster's straight line dies. Um, what this actually does is has the, the actual um, mandrel that holds the bullet sits on the bullet is on a spring so as this comes up it touches it it makes the bullet all dead straight and then it actually pushes it to where it starts to seat and then you actually load it so not a big deal you notice a lot with something like the 338 in loading something like the 223 it's quite noticeable the difference in them anyway that's the first one I tend to run all my loads um, compressed, so that means that you're doing, a, you know, and some people are worried, are concerned at running compressed, too much pressures and things. Um, I have, have always the compression, as long as you're not actually feeling any tension on it. I quite like loading in a compressed form because you get a double check, a double check of exactly. Uh, that you do have powder in there because you can actually feel the powder. Not coming up with any tension um, and then the load is all done by the actual checking of the load and the development of the load, make sure no pressuring is done in, in your analysing of the fire brass and how it actually all runs, you know, with your primer, what it looks like, what the brass looks like, um, how the gun behaves, all that sort of stuff. But essentially that's loaded. Um, so they will obviously go through and like I said at that stage, Turn this on and just see where these ones have got. Like I 
732. Mm, 732.1. Um, and that's the sort of idea of, of what I'm chasing. Um, I'll go through and do that. The, the truth of it is, these loads will will do some test files or something or other with them. I'll, if I'm doing it normally, I'll go through and do a full 50 rounds. Um, and like I said, I want to try and get them as consistent as possible. I work right across the range, um, and then uh, realistically, one box to another box, I try and keep pretty close. But really, if I'm trying to shoot super accurately, then I'm going to try and do it inside the, that ammo there. If I get a new box, then I'm going to be prepared for it to shoot a fraction different on that same day. Anyway, that's um, that's the basics of what I do loading-wise. Um, the equipment I use. Um, like I said, it, it, the RCBS stuff, um, I do tend to find, and I've used the, their, their loading dies work really well. Um, and I've, in the different choices you've got amongst them, the competition sets, the, you know, I do find it all works really nicely. Um, this fella here, the, um, the Foster straight line dies, really I noticed in the 223 stuff that it's, you've really got to focus on getting it all sat in there really nicely. Whereas when we swept out, swapped over to these, these foster straight lines, it just is a smoother feel, you get a nice feel to it. And that's probably the most important part that I'd say in actual loading, is the feel of how the bullet actually loads. That consistency um, ends up duplicating itself in your consistency of your groups. You know, if you've got your lever where you're feeling an irregularness as it actually pushes in, um, then <coughs> that tends to end up in some feet per second, some muzzle velocity difference, and that also tends to end up in some group distance, certainly when you're talking in the long, long range stuff, then you know you can see um, all of a sudden two MOA of height change through the fact of a small velocity change. As I said in my other video, um, I tend to do where I do a gang of five in a row um, is the way I tend to do that. I'll get, get a row of five and then I'll go through and actually put the bullets in as I actually. Um, as it carries on with its loading. Um, there's a couple of reasons I do this. One, as I said previously, I get a little impatient. I'm waiting for things to actually happen. Put that over there. And the reason I see some people actually go through and do a full tray, so they'll load all their powder in and then they'll put then they're gonna put all their bullets in. I don't like doing that. Myself I've found that um, the there is too much chance of you stuffing one up where you where you bang one, you where you're trying to put it down and you you whack one of the brass and or something falls over or you lose something um, in just stuffing it up through there and you've got no way of fixing it. You've got to go back again and set back up again. By doing five in a row, you really don't have that. Um, you, you, if you do mess one up, it's a lot easier to get to. You're all set up. You're still in that place. You can still go there. Uh, but I tend to find it's a nice simple thing to do. I can load, be do certainly else waiting for the RCBS machine to beep and let me know what's going on. Um, and I've only got five. If I do mess up one, it's pretty easy. We're still in the process of loading, so let's go back and do that. But really that's just a personal semantic, doesn't really matter either way. I also mentioned in the other video that I tend to run compressed. I do tend to be running compressed. Um, I'm trying to get the maximum out of the load. I'm running up to where I'm running maximum safe loads. So I've got other videos that are explaining that. But what I'm doing is I run up, uh, my, my, my load development consists of finding where I am not over pressuring my load, but I am running up to the edge of things. So I want to see a fairly square shoulder, but not completely square shoulder on the primer. I don't want to see too much witness mark on the back of the brass. Um, and then beyond that, there's other things I'm looking at. Obviously, I want the action to be smooth after I've fired it. I want the load to be able to deal with, or the round to be able to deal with different temperatures that I shoot it in. Um, I want the load to be um, or there's other details like in some cases you find that in some brass the primer pockets will start to open up um, even though you're not seeing anything else wrong you'll start to find that in the second or third or fourth loading that the primer pockets are getting too loose because it's just dealing with too much load um, and then I'm backing things off to try and get to where I get more out of the brass or and listen as I said and the thing I would say that I'd reiterate as I said I load 
um, 10 different calibers is what I'm loading at the moment so it's not a huge amount but it's still 10 different calibers and I find all of them are individuals so I'm adjusting things and learning from things all the time as I just mentioned I found over polishing my glass or over tumbling it and getting it beautiful and shiny looking and dry it nicely and that sort of stuff actually I started to see some other things one of them was on one of the rounds I started to open up primer pockets where I wasn't before now was it to do with polishing and probably not but I went back to go back to um, being a little less anal about how clean everything looks um, and more focused on how nice it shoots um, and that's working for me again changes season by season I don't expect even powder to stay exactly the same it's a formula but there's the chance of there being slight changes in that formula that end up where it's going to change a little bit season to season um, I haven't really seen much of that I, I tend to use the um, ADI powders and haven't seen a lot of it but I don't um, accept anything as gospel I don't accept anything as the only way it's going to be and I try and stay adapting and learning um, in every way I can another one a quick one I should touch on there is annealing um, I have done a little bit of annealing I built my own machine for doing that sort of thing I haven't found it being of a real benefit for what I do um, now why that is I can't really tell you it may be to do with the fact of always using the same sort of brass um, it may be the fact of how much I use the brass I'm not really sure but I haven't found the need to go there and I haven't found any real benefits from it um, even when I'm going through and using brass which I'm fire forming um, I haven't found any real change in the amount I use of the brass it's something I'm prepared to go there there's some really nice annealing machines out there to make it nice and consistent another thing I've been asked is do I neck turn to try and get the them concentric as, is, as possible um, no I don't um, I do have neck turn and some of the brasses um, so when I've uh, basically in my big one in the, the Shytech Improved what I call the 375 Gibbs um, with different brass yes I did a little bit of it um, and there's some other brasses where I've done it. I run some decent gear for doing that but what I'm actually trying to do is just get very even thickness of the actual neck um, truth is I, I do very little of that sort of stuff I try and work with quality brass um, and then I make it work for me I work out with as I said with the different um, sizing pro approaches with the different finishing side of it um, I mess with that side of things and really haven't found the need for um, trying to uh, try and improve um, making them more concentric it's not something I've actually found an issue probably the most important thing of all the thing I've done with my brass what I want to end up with is that when the actual bullet goes in um, is that this that very gentle feeling I'm pushing in there is completely consistent everyone feels exactly the same is really what I'm looking for that I found is one of the most important tips that I can offer um, in how the things actually work what they actually work like um, that's something that I have found gives me very consistent um, <laughs> grouping um, and I've done a little bit with a chronograph I don't use a chronograph very much um, and obviously the people who do it at the range and want to do 100 yards you've really got no choice um, and it's a it's a school of thought that is a very logical sound school of thought what I do with the limited time I have I shoot stuff I'm trying to make videos for you guys um, it's what I enjoy doing it's what we're out there doing and I want to see consistent grouping so I'm normally shooting at extended range so you know we're doing some thousand yard stuff for us recently but really that's pretty rare most of our shooting is actually out well beyond that where we tend to be shooting at the um, you know once we've gone subsonic so we're shooting in the 1500 yards 2000 yards two and a half thousand yards 3000 yards and out there if I've got a real variance in my FPS at all I'm going to see differences in my elevation so when I'm able to group on a plate just left right just left right maybe a little bit up down but mainly it's normally left or right a little bit of height movement but very little um, the conditions have more control over that sort of grouping out there um, so if I'm grouping close around a plate at 3,000 yards or 2,500 yards that's what I'm chasing for that's what I'm um, 
that's what I'm after and I've really got to have everything very consistent to get to that sort of place. But anyway, um, that's an overview. Um, I hope that is um, not tr too controversial this time with the bits and pieces we've neatened up. Um, I'll finish loading these little 308s. I've got some 300s to do just behind here. Um, any questions, give us a yell. Um, and um, thanks for catching up with us and we'll catch you next time.